we're ending this morning's briefing with three individuals behind uh, the venture capital that helps drive the startup economy. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Javier Sade, venture partner at Fenway Summer Ventures, Julia Taxon, vice president at GrowTech Ventures, and Mark Walsh, chairman and CEO of factsquared.com. Bob is returning to the stage for this final conversation. Thanks, Diana. Um, Javi, I want to start with you. Um, like Mark, you worked at the SBA. Uh, what, what is that experience like? What did you learn working at the SBA that maybe you didn't know going into the agency? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I've been a private sector person my whole life. So right. I've startups, I was a consultant, uh, an investor. Uh, I learned that government, th two things, that government is a very uh, difficult uh, yet important part of society and economy, something that until you're inside the belly of the beast, you don't realize. And secondly, like regardless of your political, regardless of your political leaning, um, Things that seem logical, policies that help small businesses, attract capital, uh, inject innovation into an economy, are, you, are usually decisions that are not made with logic. I learned that, uh, I always compare th things into, to the private sector where I, I felt that the Congress, the 535 members are kind of the board of directors of this company called the United States. And typically in a company, a board of directors decides things based on, for the most part, logic. Sometimes when you have 535 people pulling in different directions, politics makes things a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to have done it. I loved it. Thank you for ha having this, and thank you, Paychex, for hosting it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia, tell me what, describe your job, and on a day-to-day basis, you talked a little bit about it backstage, but what... What do you do and how do you uh, foster uh, entrepreneurship? Sure. Um, so I'm with GrowTech Ventures. We're a venture capital firm here locally <clears throat> in D.C. Um, and what does that mean, right? We're, we're investing in, in early stage technology companies. So on a daily basis, uh, it, it varies actually from day to day, which is why I was interested in the job uh, in the first place. I meet with entrepreneurs for a decent portion of, of my time. Um, I'm networking also uh, in the community, and that's with other venture capital firms, uh, with service providers who have relationships with entrepreneurs. And then the other portion of my job is spent um, with our por existing portfolio companies. And uh, I have observer seats, I have board seats. Um, you know, you get calls at all hours of the day and night, different problems, different issues. Um, and so it, it's kind of a third, a third, a third. Uh, you know, deal sourcing is, is part of it as well. Um, so I would say deal sourcing, uh, networking, uh, and then working with our existing portfolio companies. Mark, what advice would, do you give to, to startups? Uh, the administrator earlier was talking about when you have an idea, um, coming up with an elevator pitch, and, and, and then, of course, financing is a big part of it. But what, what advice do you give having been in the field for, for a while? Simplicity, scalability, and capital efficiency, to me, are the three things successful startups have to be good at. They don't have to get A's in all three, but they sure as hell can't get a C or a C minus in one of the three. The story has to be simple and understandable. Mm -hmm. The panel before is FrameBridge. Who knew, right? Selling frames online, bespoke frames. Fabulous. Tremendously successful company. The investors in it, Revolution, are uh, my old colleague Steve Case at AOL, and his team are, are in that. Just that's a simple business, makes a ton of sense. Um, scalability, as I mentioned, and, and capital efficiency. Capital efficiency means the dollars that they get invested from venture funds or other sources, friends and family, angel venture, that they use the dollars wisely. Uh, and then the, then the middle one of scalability, the, the, the worst possible outcome for a venture or a growth investment is that the company dies from success. And it is amazing to me, and I'm sure to, to others in the panel or, or today, to see some of the great ideas and great companies that had a shot they're not able to handle the demands that scalability implies. So if you see a company that gets an A, A minus, B plus in three of those, I think the investor has a pretty good shot uh, of, of seeing capital uh, growth and seeing shareholder return. What about patience? How long does it have? I mean, you know. What does that word mean? I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> um, 
I, just a quick, and then I think the other, other folks will chime in. I, I think the amount of patience today is less than the old days. The venture business, and, and, and no, uh, compared to what, what, will, what, we, what you heard about with, with her uh, typical day, but you go back 10, 20 years, the venture business was a hit business. One out of 10 would probably succeed, and that one company, you could wait four, six, eight, 10 years for a full capital return. The cycle of investment the peop for people who put money in venture capital firms was expectation of six to 10 years return. I think that patience is now, I don't want to speak for your, for your team, but I think that, that patience now is shorter. People are looking for faster returns, fewer home runs. They want a single or a double to the gap. Mm -hmm. Julia, what, what can Washington do? What can policymakers uh, do better to foster entrepreneurship and, and the growth of small business? Um, well, there is a, a breadth of capital out there mm -hmm. right now uh, in, the, in the venture community. So there's no shortage, I will say. Um, if, if you have a good idea, and a little product market fit, you can be out there raising money. Um, and, and to his point, it, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, we always tell our companies, raise enough money where you uh, can figure out product market fit before you scale. So if you're raising too much money, you, uh, most companies make the mistake of then going and throwing that money at, uh, at sales and marketing. And um, that's not necessarily a good use of money if you haven't figured out the product market fit to date. Um, as far as you know, regulations go, venture capital isn't for every company. So there are companies out there w who would benefit from other sources of capital, and um, you know whether that's state money. There's a lot of state programs out there that are encouraging venture capital in, in, in smaller communities, not necessarily in Silicon Valley, but here in, in DC and in Maryland's done a great job of that as well, um, and really fostering local entrepreneurship and, and putting money into local companies. Javier, if I'm, I've got a great idea for a, a widget. It's a fantastic widget, and somebody watching uh, live streaming on thehill.com right now. Uh, what do I do? I mean, I think there's a lot of just people don't know where to go. They don't know SBA exists. I think um, uh, what both panelists have said is true, that there's all this money s seemingly sloshing around, mm -hmm. but out of the 30 million small businesses in America, only a very small sliver gets it. It's something like... $70 billion were, was invested by venture capitalists and angel groups in 2017. And most of that money was actually invested in three states, mostly because the money's managed in three states. So if, if which, you don't- Which three? It's uh, New York, Massachusetts, and California is half of the venture capital managed and half of the capital invested. Um, not being in geographic proximity would seem to not matter anymore. We heard from the previous panel that with the advent of technology, you don't need to buy servers anymore. Uh, you don't need office space anymore. You can go to WeWorks. Um, the, starting a business is super, super easy. You can use paychecks. You don't have to have a payroll manager from day one. So there's, it's starting a business is very, very easy, and there's a... Um, there's a cognitive dissonance between the type of capital needed uh, by, let's call them Main Street businesses, and the type of risk capital that an investor is willing uh, to take. Back to your widget. Um, I think that matching the, uh, the business model or the product or the service that you're actually thinking of starting as an entrepreneur matches with a type of capital. So some of it has to do with loans. Some of it has to do with angel investing. Some of it has to do with crowdfunding, which was a response to the lack of venture capital, mm -hmm. Title III of the, uh, of the uh, Jobs Act, the CC. Um, some of it is friends and family. Some of it is swiping your credit card. So I think the first, mm -hmm. the first thing you gotta, you gotta think about is what type of capital is best for my business. Some of it has to do with what Mark was saying, patience. Um, even though uh, investors are getting less patient with their portfolio companies, the fact is that the gestation period of a company to, uh, to uh, germinate into an exit, which is really what venture, venture capitalists are not in the business of buying things, they're in the business of eventually selling them, it now takes on average 13 years. And the life of a fund, it used to take seven back in the, back in the 2000, in the early 2000s, Funds typically have a life of 10 years. So you have this, uh, this incongruence as to what a company needs uh, and, the, and the type of capital that's willing to invest in that company. So it's a, uh, it's a dynamic thing, but the first thing to do is to get smart on it. 
Mark, I, a friend of mine who's not a Washington insider was watching uh, Mark Zuckerberg testify before Congress, and he said, do all hearings go like this? Members don't know what they're talking about on, on tech issues and social media. Um, for entrepreneurship, that is, how important is that? Uh, obviously, it's very important, but going forward of getting the word out of your product, and, and how do you see this? Ev I mean, every industry, including the news business, has just evolved so quickly. Uh, where do you see uh, uh, it going, small business and entrepreneurship, and what do they have to really focus on in the coming years? You mean as far as messaging to the Hill or to legislators? No, messaging about uh, their products and telling, telling people about uh, the, the, the role of social media, the role of uh, marketing, uh, what they have, because now if you're a small business, you don't have a website, you don't have a small business. So there's an old line, many of you have probably heard this, uh, by John Wanamaker, who was the retailer in Philadelphia back in the uh, 1950s and 60s, the great store, now gone. He said, half the money I spend in advertising is wasted, but I can never tell which half, right? <laughs> so with the rise of the platforms you're talking about and the trackability of what we all do in the web, our, where our clicks, where our dollars, where our eyeballs literally go, we now know exactly which dollars are wasted and which dollars are not. So with that trackability and that clarity, a small business, I mentioned earlier simplicity, a small business that wants to grow and has a cost structure, as was said before, that is now way lower than it used to be to actually build a thing or start a business or get customers or have a platform where you can service customers and have a great company like Paychex behind you. Uh, just so you know, we were all paid to at one point say <laughs> Paychex yeah. with an X. But no, the, 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 the simplicity of, of getting on these platforms demands simplicity in your message. What you tend to see is there are lots of entrants in a new thing, and then like, all, like Darwin was right, a few brands emerge with simple messages that resonate with products that are properly priced, with margins that are sustainable, to build companies that are, that are around for many, many years and perhaps decades. But I tell folks, to your, your point, if you don't feel comfortable in social media, don't start a business. Because your comfort in providing the message you care about, even with a personal element, if you're not comfortable doing that, you're going to have a real problem today. Mm -hmm. Julia, you said you meet with entrepreneurs. That must be interesting. Um, what You mentioned uh, some, some issues about marketing. And, but they get into the room uh, with someone like you. Mm -hmm. what, what should they do before that they have their ducks in a row? What, what advice would you give them so that they can make a successful pitch? First of all, uh, get a warm introduction. So in today's world of social media, um, I feel like every entrepreneur, if you're resourceful enough, should be able to somehow find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who can introduce you. Um, so warm introduction is always going to make someone like me and, and other venture capitalists take, at least take the meeting, if not a phone call. Um, and then once you're in the room, be realistic about your company. I don't come in there and say, you know, there's no competitors out there. It's a greenfield opportunity. Uh, we're going to go from one million to 75 million uh, next year. I, you know, we, we've seen the hockey stick. Uh, we know how to discount that. Uh, and so, what I what works best with me is is honesty. Is coming in and saying, listen, you know, we have this great opportunity here. Um, Every opportunity we look at has its warts, and so you just have to be comfortable with those. And, uh, and as long as the entrepreneur can help you identify those, I feel like it takes, it takes them a, a long way. And also, um, you know, in, in our eyes, it, it, uh, it, it helps us really get comfortable with the entrepreneur as well, and that we're not, he's not, he or she uh, is not uh, BSing us. I was told not to curse. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't count. Um, we're going to open it up for, for questions. Uh, there's uh, one, one in the back. You can just identify yourself. Sure. Um, what's your, so we know that the venture capital model doesn't work for women. It doesn't work for black people with respect to the allocation of capital. We also know that there are these new tools. I asked about it earlier. Uh, crowdfunding. Uh, uh, in response to this lack of fairness with respect to capital allocation, and now ICOs. So <clears throat> we've been recommending to certainly African-American women companies, uh, uh, other minority companies, that they go to the ICO market, skip the VCs, uh, because they're not going to get funded. What's your position on ICOs, and are you going to use them uh, uh, to help uh, entrepreneurs? 
Does anybody here watch the show Silicon Valley on HBO? If you don't, you should start, if you care about what we're up here talking about. Um, I would argue, it, although it's a comedy, every word said on the scripts of Silicon Valley, I bet all of us have heard said legitimately and straight-facedly in some meeting, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But the last episode of Silicon Valley was about ICOs. It is my personal opinion that, first of all, I, I agree with your, um, your comment about the allocation of capital not being successful as gender, demography, geography, and even industrial uh, diversity. Uh, Javier and I shared a job at the SBA where that was our, one of our sole goals was to get more dollars into different kinds of pockets of different kinds of people in different kinds of places and different kinds of industries, and we made a lot of progress in doing that. I happen to think that, and I, just for the record, I am an investor in, a, uh, in blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, funds, but I think that the ICO uh, tactic for raising dollars is still so frothy that I would not personally recommend it to an entrepreneur who wants to raise money. I think, I just I want to add on that. So there's a, there's a reason um, why financial services are regulated. Um, mostly, well, it, it's, almost like, it, it's almost like healthcare. Healthcare, if you make a mistake, you perish. In financial services, you make mistakes, you go broke. Two very bad things. But your, I think your, po your point about, I, I'm not going to give you a perspective on ICOs and blockchain and all this stuff that underlies <laughs> this pathway of the capital, but what's the good news about that, the, the silver lining about the issues that have been uh, raised to the forefront, Me Too movement, um, uh, uh, inherent uh, bias in policing, there's all these social things that actually manifest themselves in business, and a subset of that is entrepreneurship. And, um, the, the, I think the silver lining is that all that stuff is getting talked about now, number one. Number two is that there's people actually really paying attention and trying to do the, trying to do the right thing. Um, things do need to change. Uh, uh, I'm a brown person myself, and I've raised money. I invest money for a living. Um, I have firsthand encountered all these, all these walls. Um, and... I think that, the, that, that since I started my career, things have gotten better. It's still not right. 2% of the money goes to African-American uh, entrepreneurs, and 0.2% goes to African-American women. Um, they're 5% of the population, right? It, it, it actually, the math, the math doesn't work, but all these things like ICOs and crowdfunding, Title III, crowd donations, there's all kinds of things happening that are um, kind of addressing this intractable sort of systematic things. And I think policymakers have a role in this, not because of social justice. So everybody thinks about uh, affirmative action when they think about inclusiveness and diversity, and it has nothing to do with, in, with affirmative action. I don't want the, uh, we don't want the bar lowered because I'm Puerto Rican and she's a woman, we want to have a chance at, at, at taking a swing at the plate. And that's where I think uh, you, you start moving the conversation from a social justice conversation to a, to a true inclusiveness that's good for business. But what do I know? <laughs> um, one, I want to go, uh, Javier, starting with you, but quickly, because we don't have much time left. The impact, same question, impact of the tax cuts. What have you seen? Have you seen a big difference? Has it affected businesses? Corporations have $2 trillion of cash parked overseas. Double that for the amount of money uh, onshore. Companies are doing really, really well. And the theory behind, it's sort of a version of trickle down, has not actually panned out. What the companies are doing with their money is buying back shares, which essentially concentrates the shareholdings, which actually hurts workers. Um, on the startup scene, in the in the uh, in the entrepreneur in the entrepreneurial kind of techie-driven things, um, not much, mostly because the companies don't make profits. Um, so, for meaning meaning that the typical the, the typical venture capital-backed company loses money for a while. Uh -huh. Um, so a tax cut for a non for a, basically a net operating loss is, I don't know, zero times zero is zero. So I, I don't think much for the kind of techie-driven businesses. Yeah, I was going to say, um, we don't really know what EBITDA is. 
uh, <laughs> kidding. We uh, were most of our most of our companies, um, you know, are not cash flow positive for a very long time, and you know, we invest mostly when a company's doing you know, less than five million in revenue. So they're and they're growing really fast. So they're by nature losing money. So we haven't seen it really affect you know our our ecosystem at this point. Going to make it unanimous. So uh, the old joke that companies that I've invested in or run is that there's no E in our EPS, earnings per share. Um, <laughs> but I'll say this. Um, every company, I bet, every company that the three of us on this panel have been involved with, have run, have invested in, have been on the board of, have been part of, we beg for the day when we have a tax issue that the government tax <laughs> rollback would, would, would have an impact for us. Because high growth companies want to become large, sustainable companies. The growth time is the fun time, it's the dangerous time, but you want to have tax implications that this new tax uh, rollback would, 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 would have affected us. But uh, right now, it's really zero impact. Well, please thank our all-star panel, and I'll hand it back to Diane.